Our second keynote for tonight is the one and only Rich Ingebretson. Um, Dr. Ingebretson has a really cool story, so are you ready for this? He graduated with a master's in physics and a PhD in physics education from the University of Utah. Then he got his MD degree from the University of Utah School of Medicine in 1993. In 94, he finished an internship in internal medicine at LDS Hospital. Then he finished his internal medicine residency <clears throat> at LDS Hospital. Um, and in 96, um, oh, that's when he finished his residency. Uh, he also finished a fellowship in emergency medicine, so he went through the other way, that way. Um, Dr. Ingebretson founded the Wilderness Medicine of Utah and a, an on-hands training course dedicated to teaching backcountry medicine to future medical professionals and nature enthusiasts while out in the wilderness. So again, this is that teaching the public how to do, how to do this. Um, currently, he is the program director of the Wilderness Medicine um, at University of Utah School of Medicine and the me medical director of Salt Lake County's Sheriff's Search and Rescue. Uh, so he walks the walk. Dr. Ingebretson is also an attending emergency room physician um, practicing er, internal medicine as well. So please welcome Dr. Ingebretson. I, I don't agree with all of that. There, um, you know, I learned uh, early on that there was a, uh, you need a, a point person to take a cause somewhere, and that has devolved onto uh, my shoulders. And uh, but anything I've ever done with the books or the lectures or the anything we've done has been a huge team of very bright uh, people that have been around me, and it has been a fun ride the last years but it is a very big, strong team effort. And even tomorrow I'm meeting with young pre-med students and medical students and residents as we forward this program. And so thank you for those comments. And Travis also, I loved your talk and I realized why I would not be able to be in the Navy. I'm just frankly scared of everything I saw and where did Travis go on that video, but proud of you doing that. And I like Travis's idea where he said, we're all uh, in the wilderness and we all are in this room to some extent a wilderness. Uh, position, whether you have a medical degree or not, but when we get out there, we are who we are. And I also want to make a comment about Lee Schusman. I don't know where Lee is. I saw him when I came in. Put your hand up, Lee, just so I can point at you. There you are. Okay, so Lee, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this, was 30 years ago when we, he, I met Lee and we started this. Uh, I was graduating from medical school and uh, Lee and I took with George Snell the first, the first idea we had of taking people down the river and teaching them wilderness medicine. And honestly, we didn't know what to teach them, except Lee said, well, let's make a list. And he started to make a list. Nobody knew how to teach medical people wilderness medicine, and it was born on that trip. And uh, uh, Lee is still here uh, teaching and supporting the effort, and I appreciate your going to it. Lee said something very interesting on that. It's one of our first meetings. He gave a lecture, and he said at that lecture, I want everyone to know that I haven't made any, I'm not being paid to teach. And that really made a huge impression on me. And since that day, I have not made one penny off of teaching or uh, uh, telling any about anybody about wilderness medicine. I have, the School of Medicine doesn't pay me to do it. I do it uh, on my own time. Uh, uh, we believe, I believe, that if you're going to do, as Travis said, teach wilderness medicine, it has to be as cheap as possible, it has to be online, and it has to go everywhere, and even free. And so I've, I've modeled that after what Lee did, and I admire you, Lee, for what you said that day. And you still haven't been paid for teaching wellness medicine since then either. But I, I, that is, that's the truth, I've not been paid. Now, I, wanted, I have two things that I want to uh, teach you. Now, someone's got to tell me how to, can, oh, is it with this? Who's in charge, Teresa? The green, there's two green buttons. Oh, the, okay. And the one is an arrow, okay. Oh, I have to say, uh, we all owe Teresa a lot, you know, who organized this. And she called me as I was driving up here and was frantic that I wouldn't get my salmon dinner. And I, well, don't worry, but she's packaging it up for me to take home. I mean, talk about graciousness. So a lot of thanks to Teresa. And thank you 
for this great uh, society for inviting me to uh, speak here. What an honor for me, and I'm, I'm grateful for this. And to think that I stand in front of these great minds and people in this room. So thank you for that. Okay, so this looks like a switch that's going to blow up a bomb. I hate to say that, but I'm going to press it anyway. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, I'm a teacher. I'm on the faculty, and I can't resist the chance of teaching and asking questions. So we'll just go through some questions here tonight, and then I'll, I'll kind of make a plea at the end. But here it goes. So which medicine, well, I can read it down there. Which medicine has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States for the treatment of giardiasis? Now, I don't expect the average public to know this question, actually, but people get giardia, and they should know when they go in. This is one of the most common causes of diarrhea in the world. It's found everywhere. It's found at the top of mountains. And uh, I've had it twice, thank you, and I didn't like it either time, and it wasn't any better the second. So I'll give you these choices, tinidazole, metronidazole, which is also called flagyl, uh, fluorozolidone, quinacrine. I actually took quinacrine uh, the two times I had it, paramycin and albendazole. Which do, you, which do you ask for, and which do you treat it with? Which is approved by the FDA? <laughs> The only one that's been approved by the FDA is tinidazole, yet everybody pr pr provides flagyl for their shimetanidazole. It's its cousin. But tinidazole is a much better drug. It's cheaper. It's a one dose, so the, uh, the compliance is good. It doesn't have all those horrid side effects that metanidazole has. I had a patient t tell me that metanidazole was an evil drug. Evil. <laughs> I could, but, well, anyway, so it is tinidazole. Well, let's go on. That's the first one. There it is, tinidazole, it's, it's the correct answer. It's the only medicine approved. It's highly effective, grade 90%, and flagic may only be as much as 75%. It may be where the, the, the giardiasis, giardia is located. It may not be as effective as getting it done. It's a very well-tolerated drug, one pill, one time. Very common treatment is metronidazole, flagyl. It's FXE, 75 to 100%, but it often causes terrible gastroenteritis side effects and it has that awful metallic taste that, that patients don't like. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this is uh, interesting because now you need to know this, not as, as Travis taught us, not as a physician or a PA or a dentist or somebody who has some medical background. You just need to know things about being safe in the back country. Uh, it, the wilderness medicine, as Travis said, is not the heartbreaker of medical people. It's for everyone. And so our goal at the School of Medicine is to provide that education to everybody for free or near free all over the world. And I'll tell you how we're doing that here in just a minute. Let's ask this one. So you and your friends decide to go on a river trip. You want a clothing fabric that will absorb water, insulate even when wet. Which fabric does that? Wool, silk, polyester, or cotton? What is it? So you need to know this. If you're going to back country, you're going to get wet. This is a big one. What is it? Yeah, wool is the answer. Wool absorbs a lot of water. For example, merino wool, which is the new thing out there, but it's really great, doesn't it? is capable of holding 30% of its weight in water absorption before the weather can even fill it on their skin. Even with the water that is a sword, the wool maintains insulation. It is a huge plus for its material. Sheep, you have used it forever, and you can talk to any one of them. And, uh, you know, but if, if you talk to a goose, they won't like it. But I'm telling you, sheep love wool. And uh, the one byproduct of sheep is I, years ago, I dated a girl up in Idaho, and they had a sheep farm. And I remember sharing sheep, and our, my hands were just covered with lanolin. It was really wonderful. So let's go on. 80% of material is trapped air. Wool is also wind resistant. Many people use wool as base layers. Once blind is being itchy. The ultra-fine merino wool is itch-free, naturally breathable, moisture-wicking, fairly fast-drying, not prone to orders. Uh, the, the, the pros of that is cheap and it's wind-resistant. Con, it's more difficult to dry. It's very, very heavy when it's wet. It's also very pretty. It's a nice gift. It's inexpensive. You want to give a gift to someone and they dye it wool. So you want to wear wool. And I forget whether one of these is, talks about wool socks, but I'm just going to make you all promise that you take you and your friends and your family and you make sure you wear wool on your feet. You should have nothing on your feet in the back country but wool. Now you can put some polyester and some liners and things if you want wool on your feet. Wool is our friend in the outdoors. It keeps us warm even when wet, and that gets to be a huge plus if you're going somewhere where it might be raining or wet. So there it's products. It's gorgeous material, and uh, it's very, very effective. Wool on your feet always. Wool sweaters, wool clothing is really effective. So which fabric imitates wool? Synthetic fibers, fleece, microfibers, or synthetic down? Which is it? 
which of our fabrics it mimics wool. This is important for backcountry medicine. You know what it is? I'm wearing it on my body right now. <laughs> fleece. It's fleece. And I got, this is actually new. I lost my other one. I can't remember. Last week, so I got this $22. It was on sale down at uh, uh, Smith's. So uh, synthetic fiber. So it's fleece. Fleece is the answer. Uh, it's, it imitates wool. It's, it, it, they've really tried to make it look a lot like wool. Uh, warm when wet, but does not absorb moisture. What's great about fleece, if you don't know this, you put it in the washing machine and you pull it out and it's dry. It, you don't even need to put it in the dryer. It just does not hold on to water. So it dries very, very quickly. The pros are it's warm as wool, half the weight, and it's very, very inexpensive. But the problem with fleece is the wind. It, the, it doesn't stop wind. So if you're going on a trip where you know there's going to be wind, and now like my friends and family will take us to the top of mountains, and I take my, my fleece up there, but on the top of those mountains, it's windy, and fleece doesn't stop the wind at all. Now, why is that important to know for backcountry medicine? Because you're going out there. You're going to take your kids, family, friends. You're going to be a medical professional advising them. You've got to say fleece is really good. It's very good with water, but it doesn't stop the wind, which is a big deal because you lose heat with the wind. Okay, let's go to another question. There it is, fleece. All right. Uh, true or false? Cotton kills. Who's heard that? Cotton kills. Do we want to wear cotton in the backcountry? Well, false is the correct answer. Cotton doesn't uh, effectively wick water away from the skin, but it doesn't kill. Some of you have cotton shirts on now, and you're alive, and I can tell because you're laughing at my jokes. So, uh, but it doesn't. But here's the deal. So, cotton doesn't effectively wick moisture away from our skin. It doesn't dry quickly, and it's a very poor insulator. So we get these conductive heat losses, meaning when we touch something with wet, water rapidly uh, causes heat to flow away from us. So if you have water on your skin or in your clothes, then you'll get cold very, very quickly. So in reality, cotton doesn't kill. Hypothermia is what kills. Getting cold is what kills us. It's easier to get hypothermia when you wear cotton, not because it doesn't insulate you as well as other materials, but it doesn't insulate you as well when it's wet. So you don't want cotton if you're trying to stay warm and dry. And you don't want it on your feet ever. Uh, but if you're around camp, you want to put on a, I mean, cotton is really inexpensive. It's beautiful and it's colorful and it's nice. Just don't count it to keep you warm when you're wet. And that's how cotton is bad. But cotton is kind of a sneaky little thing. It gets into everything. It's in corduroy, denim, flannel, duck, 50-50 blends. So be careful with it. You really don't want to wear cotton in the back country if you're going to get wet or if you're sweating because it won't keep you warm. And so uh, cotton is not the, the bad thing. Uh, it, it's, it's, it can be. And it's nice material. I, mean, I like cotton. So just be careful with it. Okay, name that disease. Okay, this is a... Uh, you're hiking with a friend. You're about 12,000 feet or about 4,000 meters up in the air. It's a 42-year-old male who complains of shortness of breath or wet cough. He had similar symptoms in the recent past. He says that his chest feels tight with congestion. You hear crackles. He's a little blue in color. You went up the mountain very fast. So what disease does he have? Well, he's getting something in his lungs. Now, let me tell you something. Well, let's go on, and we'll study this for a second. What is your best guess to, to his condition? Uh, on t on uh, uh, Tuesday night, I went to dinner with a young man who had taught our search and rescue class for our school of medicine. And he had a friend that helped teach. And I took him to dinner just to talk about the class we're going to do next year. And he told me that his father-in-law died in his arms of this disease 15 years ago in the mountains. This disease is the, as a result. So this disease is high altitude pulmonary edema. Now let me explain something about what uh, edema means. And uh, this is something that doesn't have to do with medicine or doctors. It has to do with nurses or with dentists or with any medical professional. It has to do with everyone that goes up in the mountains. When we go up in the mountains for a variety of reasons, it's not important to know, liquid leaks out of our vessels everywhere. Our lips get big, fingers, skin, we get puffy. And it depends upon the person and, and various things, but we go up, water leaks out. If it, the only two places we worry about that water coming out is in our brain and in our lungs. If you have big lips, okay. If your fingers get puffy, 
Okay. But if it gets in your brain and your brain swells, it will kill you. And the earliest signs of it getting in your brain are nausea, headaches, the common things. We call that acute mountain sickness. Bad nightmares. And then as the water gets bigger and more, the brain swells. And we change the name from acute mountain sickness to high altitude cerebral edema. And that will kill you too. In the lungs, which is the case we sit up here, lung water leaks into our lungs. We watch for this. It could be a simple cough, and you think, well, they've got bronchitis, they're not feeling well. High altitude pulmonary edema, which is this case, uh, comes out of these, it could be genetics. If there's one thing that causes high altitude pulmonary edema, it is if you've had it before. That's the number one, and how quickly you go up. If you go up quick, you're likely to get cerebral edema or altitude illness. If you go up quickly, you're likely to get a fluid in your lungs. And then how high you go, that matters. Higher altitudes are more likely. And the intensity, if you have a lot of backpack on and weight, that tends to make that. But it doesn't have to be high, and it doesn't have to be fast, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be. So we want you to watch for that. The treatment is to go down. When do you go down? Now. Wait till morning? No. Instantly, now, immediately, go down, day or night, rain or snow, go down. How far? As far as you can. A hundred feet may make the difference between life and death. This young man that told me that his father-in-law died in his arms, they just said, well, wait till morning. They were up at 10,000 feet in the Uinta Mountains, and he died in his arms. They had a helicopter on the way. They were walking him to the helicopter when he collapsed and died. Watch for this. Don't wait. Go down. Go up slow when you go into the mountains and go down quickly. Learn about high altitude illnesses. Rapid descent is essential. Don't wait until morning. Patients improve very quickly with high altitude pulmonary edema. It's quite amazing how quickly. The best way to prevent altitude illness is to go up slowly and acclimatize. Uh, lack of pressure is the root of the condition. When you go up in altitude, we lose atmospheric pressure and we become sick. Go up slow, let your body acclimatize. And if you start having symptoms of headaches, nausea, uh, an inability to walk or coordinate, go down right then. If you have an inability, not because you're out of shape and you're not breathing, but you get gurgling and you get signs of flu in your lungs, go down. Don't wait till morning. And it's amazing to me how difficult to turn that is for people. At my advanced stage, uh, I climbed King's Peak last year with my family and friends. And that's a big thing. It's 28 miles in and out. Uh, and it's a uh, 5,000 foot elevation, elevation and 13,400. And we got up there with some kid, a father and his son had flown in from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Had flown to Salt Lake the night before, camped and hiked up, and they were up there with horrible altitude illness. And it was scary. And uh, the dad was particularly bad. So we, we, we were there, we just said, you're coming down with us. And we walked them down and made sure that they got down in altitude and they got out that day so that they would be uh, safe. Uh, because they'd gone from zero to 13, four in 24 hours, and they weren't handling it very well. So go down. It's amazing to me how people don't go down with that. It's the hardest turn. All right. By the way, I'll get to this in a minute, but all of this you can learn. You can learn it for free. Uh, I'll give you a couple of plugs for this as we go along, but we created a podcast series for my medical students initially. It's called AWLS. We have one called BWLS. You can go on there for free and listen to it. As you're driving and learning, we have over 80 podcasts now. Last year, 100,000 people listened to our podcast. Well, 100,000 downloads. Either one person listened to it 100,000 times or 100,000 people listened once, and I'm not sure. But we had 100,000 downloads, and, and we, we don't get paid for that. We don't monetize it. We have very interesting podcasts. We have a man, uh, I'll just tell you right now about it, who, whose son died at the Chain Lakes in 2018. Uh, his name was Doug Julian. He was a 17-year-old boy. He'd been up there three days, and he dies. They waited, and too late to get, try to get him down. And he died up in the Chain Lakes at 10,200 feet. And he lives at 5,000 feet, and he died at 10,200 feet. I asked, Doug called me and asked to, to, if he could uh, help teach, because his crusade now is to prevent kids from dying of altitude illness. We, we created a podcast. So go AWLS, wherever you listen to podcasts, and go look for my son died of haste. And listen to this 20-minute gut-wrenching, very educational, but in some ways uplifting story that Doug is now uh, doing. In fact, it's so powerful as Doug's talk, 
we're flying him to France this year to our course uh, that we teach over there, and he's going to lecture 70 everybody over there, pre-med, undergraduates, business majors, doctors, residents, dentists, everyone that shows up is going to hear that story because Doug's story about his son dying. So go out and listen to our podcast. Tell people about it. We don't monetize it. It's there for you uh, to learn. Let's do this. Can I, I can't even read this. It's what happens when you get old, Lee, and I'm serious about this. I can't read. A 28-year-old lady comes to you with a fine rash that covered. Oh, this is a good one. I'll get you guys. Now, this is something that you need to know uh, as you go out in the back country. This is, uh, this is something new. And I, I'm, I, this has been a little uh, thing of mine uh, that I like. So uh, a, a fine rash that comes most of her body. It's been going on for the last several weeks. It's very itchy and keeps her up at nights. In fact, that was the hallmark of this thing, uh, was that th- this lady could not sleep. This is uh, in the East, actually. She had tried everything possible. She cannot get rid of it. She doesn't know of any allergies she has. She's had nausea and diarrhea as well, which is an interesting uh, side of this disease. She has complaints of abdominal pain. Uh, she is a hiker and recently returned from eastern Tennessee up, up, on the, up on the plateau up there, which is so gorgeous, part of our country. Uh, she, had, uh, she had one tick, but no other encounters with insects. She took some ibuprofen after the hike. She had uh, changed her eating habits, had not changed her eating habits, she has not tried different soaps or lotions. A very likely cause of this is Lyme disease, food allergy, medicine allergy, atopic dermatitis, which is a fancy name for we don't know what it is, from the humidity in Tennessee, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There you go. By the way, I'm going to ask you this question right now. Maybe it's later in the talk. I can't remember. Where is Rocky Mountain spotted fever found? Not in the Rocky Mountains. They named it after the Rocky Mountain Lab in Bozeman. There is no Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the Rocky Mountains. It is in the east. Tennessee, North and South Carolina, even over towards Oklahoma, but eastern Tennessee is littered with it. Lyme disease is up in the northeast. One thing you want to know is when you travel and when your patients come to you or your friends, your family come and travel and they say, where are you going? You want to look and see what diseases are in that area so that you know what you're expecting. And when you go to eastern Tennessee, you're going to be exposed to Rocky Mountain spotted fever. If you go up to to Connecticut, you're going to be exposed, or southern Wisconsin, you're going to be exposed to Lyme disease. It's really important that you know that, and it's not a subtle thing. You've got to do that. So anyway, there it is. Which is this? What disease or what problem did this 28-year-old lady have? This is actually a true story. I modeled it. Uh, I changed the name, of course. But who, what do you think it is? I hear Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Any other takers for I answer? You don't know, obviously. This is a new disease. Maybe you know it, but you should know this disease. It is, it is now overtaking the, the southeast and the Midwest. And so uh, this is a food allergy. It's called the alpha-gal syndrome. Anybody heard of that, AGS? A couple of people have. Anybody seen it? You seen it? Or did you have it? So murmurings of alpha-gal syndrome came out about 15 or 20 years ago. They started treating patients with chemotherapy for various cancers. And they didn't know why they were getting these awful rashes. And then all of a sudden these people about five or six years ago started coming into clinics and doctor's offices with these horrible rashes and even life-threatening conditions. And they determined that it was a sugar called the alpha-gal it, it, it is, in fact, the uh, uh, alpha-gal galactose A13 galactose sugar. Now, you need to memorize that. <laughs> now, they call it alpha-gal. That's what the, me- the medical people call it. And it's found not only in these chemotherapeutic agents, but it was f- it's found naturally in hoofed mammals. Just naturally found in there. And what happens is a tick, and it's a tick, a single type of tick. Now, in Europe, they're investigating it might be another type. We're not sure. It is the Lone Star Tick, and I have had Lone Star Tick on me. Every time I go to Tennessee to teach, which is last year was three times, and each time I went, we were outside, I got a Lone Star Tick on me. You brush it off, but the Lone Star Tick is very, very common. We don't have it in Utah, but they have it down there, and it is a, the only tick that is now known to carry the alpha-gal syndrome. If it has bitten a hoofed mammal, it has the sugar, and then it will sensitize you. It can, and then when you eat a hamburger or any meat, 
then you become allergic to it. So it is a meat allergy caused by a tick. And why is that a wilderness issue? Because it's, it's brand new. And one of our goals at the School of Medicine with our students and residents is to find these new diseases and make the public aware of it. Can you get it here? Not as likely because we have the Lone Star Tick. But who goes to the south? Who goes to the southeast? At least where the Lone Star Tick is. You have to keep ticks off your body and don't be bitten because now there's this new entity. So people become sensitized to it. So Lone Star Tick is the only tick in the United States known to carry the sugar and sensitize people. After a person eats red meat after the tick bite, they develop a serious uh, allergic reaction. That can be life-threatening. People have died of this, so you have to be careful. There's a couple of diseases being spread around the United States now by the Lone Star Tick, and uh, uh, we have to be careful of that. And I'm not going to go into those right now. Well, maybe it does. I can't remember where this uh, slide showed us, but, but the answer to this is keeping ticks uh, off of us. So symptoms commonly appear two to six hours after eating meat. AGS reactions can be different person to person. They can range, this is from the CDC site, they can range from mild to severe even life threatening. People may not even have an allergic reaction after having been exposed to the alpha-gal syndrome with the Lone Star Tick. So be aware of that one. If you go into an area where there's Lone Star Tick and if people start getting rashes it may, after they eat hamburger, it's because of that. AGS, new syndrome. All right. There are some of the symptoms that I put. That picture comes from the uh, CDC site. The thing about it was the nausea and the vomiting and the abdominal pain. That is also a sign of alpha-gal. So if somebody comes with a rash and it's a kid or a family member or it's a patient of yours and they don't have that, it may not be the alpha-gal syndrome. It just may be an allergy to something. It depends upon the rash. But if they have, a, a, they usually get, most people get abdominal symptoms with alpha-gal syndrome. Okay, we'll move on to lightning. What type of lightning kills most people worldwide? So there's uh, different kinds of lightning. It's strike or direct hit, it's side splash, upward streamer, contact with an object struck with lightning. So which of these kills most people, do you think? You're outdoor people, you'll go outdoors. Lightning, you don't have to be a physician, you don't have to be a nurse or a dentist. You don't have to be a medical person to understand lightning. We all go in the back country. This is why we want you to go to our site at the University of School of Medicine and, and, listen to our, and listen to our podcast for free so that you'll be safe in the outdoors. Follow, call it the uh, be, be to learn it all, like Travis taught us. So the answer to that is the ground current. Ground current kills most people. And this was very, 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 very frightening to me last fall. Because I have been asked to participate in the NICA Riders for our state of Utah, one of the most exciting things ever I've been involved with. These uh, high school kids, from freshmen to seniors, pedal their bikes on a mountain trail, and uh, they, it, 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 these boys and girls are out pedaling as hard as they can, thousands of them on a single bike ride, thousands of them. And it is one, it's remarkable because it brings families together, uh, the, you see these kids biking with other people in their family and friends, little guys, little girls who don't have the strength of, you know, big pro athletes can win these races. You know, the, the smaller people are better because they have all the weight and they're strong. Anyway, it's a neat thing, but then we were down in uh, Price and all of a sudden you could see a thunderstorm coming in, like lightning was coming out of this cell. And they said this, the race is being canceled, shelter in place. I went, oh my gosh. First of all, what does that mean? Just shelter where you are and just let the lightning strike you? Or what does it mean? And that had, made, had no meaning to me. And I, so um, we saw everybody huddle underneath their team tents. And I went, oh my gosh. Well, the people I was with, my friends, I said, let's get to your cars because the car is a safe place. If a lightning strike hit near where those tents were, everyone under that tent would it be injured or die? It's the worst thing you can do. So one of the things we're working with the National Interscholastic Collegiate Association, a marvelous, wonderful organization, is trying to help them to understand safe ways to keep bikers safe and people safe. And so they've asked us, uh, uh, we, we put all, all of our students and residents on, on this, and we, come up, we came up with a curriculum called Bike Med, and it's, it, it's uh, for the bikers, the coaches, and in there we made a big case. If you see lightning, get to your cars. 
There's no safe place outdoors. And we're really trying to get that over. So one of the things we can do is understand that it's ground current that kills. It hits the ground. It kills everybody around it. And, or injures them, certainly. There's a, that's a, you never know whether things are photoshopped. That's a photograph of a golf course where lightning struck. There's a lot of videos online of outdoor events where people are, are at hit. So when lightning strikes the ground, the electricity does not disappear into the earth. It spreads out in the ground. These currents are the biggest danger because they affect large areas and large people. It goes up one leg down the other. It can stop the heart uh, from beating. So we want you to be aware of that. Uh, when do lightning strike most? Uh, in front of, during, or after a storm? So storm's coming. When are you most frightened? We're well, going to be frightened all the time. Catch your car, go inside. There's no safe place outdoors. But when do they strike mostly? Before, during, or after? What's your best guess? You should all know this. It happens before the storm. Lightning originates at the top of the thunderstorm. They call it positive lightning. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. It can strike as far as 10 miles away, 16 kilometers, and it's pretty frightening. So uh, a, a thunderstorm is like a capacitor. Charges, positive, negative. The positive charge looks for a negative charge on the ground. It could be however far away it is, it'll hit it. And those people will be under blue sky, and they're hit. And that's where most lightning strikes is ahead of a storm. Now, Noah used to say uh, the 30-30 rule. 30 seconds, and then you have to run somewhere, and 30 minutes after. Then they realized that people thought that it was safe to be outdoors, so they scrapped that. They scrapped the 30-30 rule, and we opposed that, and now Noah's dropped it, and now it is when lightning roars, go indoors. Or to your car, in case of the Nike riders. Go indoors, because this will happen, and you can get struck, and it will strike the ground and injure a, a lot of people. Okay, team, here we go. This is for your summer picnics when you go outside. What are they? Which of these sets of drugs has been approved by the FDA and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control for the prevention of mosquito bites? The number one killer in the world, the mosquito kills more people on the planet than any other creature that we know of. A million people are going to die this year of mosquito bites. In our country, uh, people say, well, we're safe. No, we're not. We have West Nile virus, for one. And that, we don't, they don't have that in other places except in the Nile Valley. But uh, why do we, uh, uh, which of these? DEET, Picardine, oil of lemon, eucalyptus. DEET, IR3535, which is skin so soft. Picardine. Or DEET, oil of lemon, eucalyptus, or, and citronella oil. Which are the ones approved by the FDA. To best guess. And you need to memorize this for this summer so when you go out on your picnics and people say, what do you put on? What if somebody came to you and said, I've got a one-month-old baby. What do I put on my baby? What do you do in that? So in this case, the answer to this is A, DEET, Picardine, oil of lemon, eucalyptus. And every time I go to the store, whatever store, I look and see what they are selling. And two nights ago, I was in Dan's in Salt Lake City on Foothill Boulevard, and I went, and they were selling 100% Picardine. So that's all they had out. They didn't have DEET, and they didn't have oil, lemon, eucalyptus. Now, lemon oil in Africa is what they use. They, they swallow it. I've been over there several times with uh, uh, Dr. Justin Coles. I don't know if he's here. Justin, are you here? No, maybe. Oh, there you are back there. Uh, they eat uh, lemon oil. They swallow it. Very effective. So that was approved. It was, in fact, approved because of West Nile virus spilling over in the late 1970s and 1980s. They were afraid a lot of people were going to die of that. So they, they had the answer is those DEET works because uh, mosquitoes not, don't like the smell of it. And that came out of those researchers then at Davis. And when I did the research for the chapter I was asked to write on mosquitoes, I thought, you know, I understand that because I don't like the smell of DEET either. You know, Picardine works as a receptor blocker. You don't need to memorize that. Oil, lemon, eucalyptus works by blocking chemical receptors. You don't need to memorize that. What we do want you to know, IR3535 is skin so soft. You put that on kids. You can't put anything on babies. You just have to keep them covered up. Nothing goes on two-month-old and younger. Someone says, what do I put on my newborn? Nothing. You cover them up. That's it for sun, sunscreens, for sunburn, and for mosquitoes. Um, 
uh, skin so soft is good for toddlers, though. And, uh, you know, because baby, the kids don't like all this smelly stuff. So, uh, but it's not, a, it's not very good. DEET is the best. DEET is really the very best stuff out there. Nothing, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of studies have tried to knock DEET off the market, and they haven't come close. Citronella oil is good, but it's not very good as DEET. But it's better than nothing, and you can put it on toddlers. So uh, what do you put when you go outside? Picardine is great. You can't put it on babies, but it's it, it's really good. That's why it's on the it's on the shelves. It'll work. It's not as good as deep, but out, down here now in the southeast, we're worried about new diseases, Zika, which is one of the most frightening diseases out there because it causes birth defects, and people don't know that they have the disease. It goes from father, or it goes from boy to girl in intercourse, and it goes from girl to boy in intercourse. And you can spread it that way, not just by mosquitoes. And so a, ma, a, a lady who's pregnant can get a birth defect and not even know they've been sick. So you, that's where you have to be careful with Zika. Dengue is in our country. Malaria is in the Keys. Chikungunya is in our country. And that's all spread by the, uh, the, the tiger or the Egyptus mosquito. And Picardine will work. So if you go out in those countries down there or in South California where you're seeing these new diseases, put on the mosquito repellent and use Picardine. Deed is the best. And on babies, keep them covered. On toddlers, you can use IR-35. You just have to keep rubbing it on every hour. So what? It's a nice lotion. And the kids like it, but just keep, them, keep it on. So there's Deed, great. Picardine, very good. Lemon oil, eucalyptus, very good. And... IR-35 is for babies down to two months. But uh, you could probably get it away down there. It's just not been approved for babies. But I wouldn't put DEET, Picardine, or lemon oil on two months and under. We just don't know, especially DEET. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the IR-35 skin so soft you might get away with. There they are, Anopheles, Aculus, Aetis. There's 3,000 species of mosquitoes. And only three of those infect humans. And in our, in our state right here, all we have is the Culex. Occasionally, we can get the Anopheles. It does crop its ugly head up here. We don't get the tiger mosquito up here, so we don't have Zika. We don't have uh, chikungunya. We don't have dengue. But we do get uh, West Nile virus, which Culex spreads. And occasionally, we get the Anopheles. But we don't have malaria in this country. And Anopheles is the only uh, mosquito that spreads malaria. In fact, it's the only disease that spreads and it's just not in our country anymore. Okay, here's my uh, appeal. So I want you to look at this site. It's called Wild Med U, wildmedblocku.org. It's free. Everything on that site is free. There's eight textbooks on that site, downloadable. They're well written. It's free. We have our AWS and our uh, BWS, our backpacking medicine, wilderness travel and tropical medicine. Everything you can study on there is for free. Our podcasts are free, our textbooks are free, our practice tests are all for free. And when Travis said, <laughs> I don't know, I had a crusader. Uh, and I don't, I didn't know if I ever wanted to be an icon. Have you ever been to Greece? <laughs> what statue? I'm not them you don't want to admire. Them. But anyway, so, but I do believe in this. And I'm just going to get on a soapbox. The problem with wilderness medicine education, it's too darn expensive. And it's the harbanger of rich people. And we've got to change that. You've got, our sites are free. The only thing we ask is you pay for the certification. $30 for everything up there. The, A, uh, BW, uh, the AWS is, for, uh, is 30 60 and 90 And if you say, I can't afford it, we'll waive the fee. Today, I got an email from a resident that said, I, we're just over our heads in uh, bills with my wife and our new babies. Can I just certify an AWS and not pay for it? I said, absolutely. I gave him the code. You don't have to pay for anything. But uh, all of the resources are for free, and our podcasts are for free. And I don't make money, and I blame Lee Schusman for me being poor today when I could have had a lot of money. No, I don't. And so the other thing I'm going to ask you, so if you want to get BWS teaches sports, climbing, hiking, backpacking, shoes. It teaches everything that we think you all want to do. Go read the textbook, listen to the podcast, do the practice test. 
and you will be safer in the back country, and your friends and family will be safer, and all of that is for free. Just if you want that certificate, it's 30 bucks, and that includes CME for it. The AWS is 90 bucks for, and it's that includes 17 or 16 hours of CME hours. It's only 90 bucks. I finagle that for people who need the CME hours. Normally, they charge 700 dollars. So anyway, but you can get, do it for free, and we want. Now, here's the other thing I'm going to ask you. And I don't know how long I go. I, I, someone said midnight or 1 a.m. I'm not sure. It's one of those. It's 8 o'clock. We'll be, we'll be done here in a second. But here's the deal. I have two, two things that I do in my life. One is educate. And that is my number one goal in life, is to educate people about wilderness medicine and do it at a low cost or free so that we can get these valuable tools out there to save lives so that Doug Julian's kid doesn't die again in the mountains and that you don't get Aplegal syndrome and that you know what sunscreen to or not to put on babies. That's really important stuff, and you don't have to be a physician or a nurse or a dentist or a PA or an EMT to know that. Everyone should know that. And so go to our site. It's called wildmedu.org. Now, the other thing I'm going to ask you to do is since there's no salaries paid to this, to keep, and we don't make, it's a zero-sum game. We do ask you to donate. So when you go on that site, you can see a little button up on the right that says donate. And then I actually put a bigger icon in the middle. If you have $10, $20, just go there. And uh, that goes a long way to support our students and our residents, get them around the world, and they do our research. They write our books. They write our questions. There's, I, tomorrow I'm meeting with a kid who, who's just, his wife's just having a second baby. He's a second-year, rising third-year medical student. And we are paying him to write questions on a new chapter called the, uh, uh, sunscreens. What do you know about sunscreens? You put them on, nobody knows anything about them. You just know how to put them on. Do they prevent cancer? Do they stop sunburn? What are the odds if you put on sunscreen, are you going to keep cancer? Well, I'll tell you, it's 50% risk of melanoma, 40% risk of squamous cell carcinoma if you put it on. What, sun, what is sunburn protection factor? So our students and residents wrote this incredible chapter on sunscreens. It's going in the backpacking textbook, and we're going to have a practice test. So that young man who has a new baby, second-year medical student, wants to support his family, I pay him $25 an hour to do that. So donate $25 so that uh, future Dr. Sil uh, Sylvester can support his new baby. That's all we ask, okay? <laughs> I don't get it. So if you have $25 and you want to donate it to the University of Utah School of Medicine, we'd be appreciative of that, and you'll get a nice little thank you cord, uh, card from Taylor Randall or somebody who is going to say thank you for donating 25 bucks. It goes a long, long way. That kid in an hour will produce more stuff than you can possibly imagine. A lot of these residents and people do that. So anyway, wildmedu.org, AWS podcast, BWS podcast, it's free. Okay? So, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to go... Uh, Let's end it before midnight, okay? Oh, did I tell you today that I saw a patient uh, in my clinic? <sighs> Just crazy. She said that she had become addicted to many things, and now she's addicted, and she drinks brake fluid. I said, what the heck? She said, oh, don't worry. I can stop any time. <laughs> so anyway. Now, if you didn't see that one coming, okay, then you're not on top. You don't know the, the dad jokes very, very, very well. But I, uh, I, the only thing I to tell you is I do run. And the only thing I, I had to give up tonight coming here is I was going to run tonight. But I'll run in the morning. I run every day, but I never run in races. Except a couple years ago I did. I had my family friends talked me into running in a race. I didn't like it. They said uh, all these prizes, and they said, come forth and, have eternal, and get eternal life. But I came fifth and got a toaster and so I just sort of gave up on it. No more, no more. That's the last one. Okay. Where is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? I already talked about this. Let me just show you where it's at. There's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So if you go to those countries and you're in the outdoors, know what disease, you know, know before you go, what are you going to see back there before you get it? Now here's something that uh, you don't need to be a medical professional to do this. I was on a river trip almost two years ago over by where Lee and I used to go. We were on the Green River and one of the river guides uh, we were actually uh, uh, raising money for another program that I've been involved with, involved with environment. And so we had all these guys there. But this river guy came up to me and he said, my toe really hurts. He said, I, I don't know what to, what to do. He said, it's got this little cut on it. And I said, whoa, that's not a cut. That's, you didn't stub it. That is a chillblains. 
And he goes, what's the chill blade? And I said, oh my gosh, you're a river guy, and you know what chill blades is. So here it is, a 24 mile is an inflatable cock in Muddy Creek and Desert River in Central Utah. At the end of the second day, he had a very sore toe. They looked like the blister to him. He came for advice. Anyway, so what is a diagnosis and what is a treatment? Well, I already told you, this is called a chill blades. And uh, a chill blade, uh, sometimes they call it perineal. I always call it a chill blade, but when you do the research and things, you see what other people call it, perineal or chill blades. It's a small itchy swelling on the skin that occurs. And it's a reaction to cold. It's not, not going to take your life, but I'll tell you something. It's uh, an irritating thing. And I said, well, he said, what's the answer to it? What would you say is the answer to chill blades? If you're on a river trip and somebody comes and they have a child that's all inflamed, has a little itchy kind of s a sore spot in it, Wool socks, there you go, dry, thank you. <clears throat> so the f first aid for chill blades is to, is to keep it dry, and that is to prevent, we'll do maybe a couple more than we'll be done. Prevent further exposure, remove wet, constrictive clothing, wash and dry, and elevate and cover with loose, warm clothing. So there's some more chill blades. You can see, and they, they itch and they burn. But they're not going to take your life, but they're going to ruin your trip for you. So it's a reaction to cold. That is covered in the BWS textbook, and it's also covered in, in our chapters that we do in our podcast. We have a podcast on this, so you can go listen to our podcast. This is a, one of my patients. This is on a river trip. This is painful. Now, Travis will know about this because he's a Navy guy, and those guys get wet a lot, so I bet he hit me and those people that had this. You're approached after a long day in a summer, summer river trip, 35-year-old male Bowman, has painful feet. What is your diagnosis? What is treatment? And this is more serious than perineal or chillings. This could lead to an amputation. This is, a, this is a bigger deal. I see this all the time on my river trips. I see this in, in patients who have hyperhidrosis. Their feet sweat a lot, and we make them wear sandals. So this, this is uh, immersion foot, trench foot. Army people get this a lot. It's a non-freezing injury to the foot. It develops when feet are exposed to moisture for prolonged periods. <clears throat> Cold and moisture soften the skin, predisposed to infection. <laughs> so this can lead to uh, infection. So you have to get it dry. And uh, that's a bad one. This guy had it really bad. So what we did is just made him keep it uh, dry for the whole time. <coughs> my, my outdoor activity is hiking and river rafting. I love hiking with family and friends. Uh, and I love going on river trips like we did with Lee back in the day. So be careful with that one. <coughs> I may do a uh, skip to a case, but I'll do this one. This happened up in the Wasatch Mountains. So by this series, a long time ago, we saw this one. Uh, she, this young lady had been up in the snow for a long time. She changed her clothing except for boots. She took Advil, walked out all that day with an unaffected companion. She arrived at our emergency room. This is her right foot. I take it the next day. That white stuff on there is silvadine. That's not her skin. That is silvadine we put on it. What is a diagnosis? And what is the treatment? So she'd been in cold water without shoes for hours, half a day, almost a day. Uh, this is frostbite. That's her to left toe taken about two weeks later. Thawing frostbite is very painful. But you have to do it correctly. And pain is good in this case. I think one of the problems with pain is you say pain is bad, but pain is really good with frostbite because it means the limb is alive and that you're thawing it correctly. A poor thawing process will cause harm. If thawed too slowly, it will increase the production of prostaglandins and thromboxane, which are you don't need to memorize. Just remember that if you have frostbite, uh, it's rapid rewarming. Jacuzzi temperature water, 100 degrees, 40 degree water. Just where you'd sit if you're going to go out with your friends sit in a jacuzzi. should be done only when there's no chance of refreezing. General, general, uh, gently circulated water, you know, 100 degrees, and then put it in there. It'll hurt. It will hurt, and that's good. And you've done that if you've been shoveling snow and you put your hands under water to warm it, it burns, but that's okay. Uh, so anyway, okay, I admit, this may be the, uh, we'll see, this is a story, I'll let it, you and it, uh, it's 8.05, I'm in about an hour, or no, maybe 50 minutes. You and a bunch of friends have decided to kayak in Idaho. All of you are experienced kayakers. You all have new kayak helmets. The river you choose is the Payette River. It's a sad story, but there's a nice ending to this. The river you choose is the Payette River. Now, that's a river which I chose not to do. And the reason I chose not to do it, it's beautiful, but when we do the salmon and other rivers up there, but the Payette River is real rocky, and rocks scare the heck out of me. And so, uh, and if they get covered, then they make reversals, and you can bong your head and things. So I just avoid it. Always, we'd look at this, but I never do the Payette River, although it's absolutely gorgeous. And then they, these guys got to a rapid called Jacob's Ladder Rapid. 
Now, I'm going to give a uh, disclaimer right now because I told this story at a class in Moab once. And in the audience were guides that were on this. And the person this happened to, his girlfriend, was in the audience. And so I, I, ever since I tell the story again, I get a little nervous for that reason. So uh, one of the better kayakers, a 20-year-old kid named Lucas Turner, who overturned, he didn't come up for a while, and uh, so they got scared. Now, what's not told her, they actually got in the cars and they lost him and they drove down and found him in an eddy, it turns out. And uh, the helmet had been pushed back over his head and he had an abrasion on his forehead. He was unconscious, floating down. He was unresponsive. So they took him, got him to the shore. There's Jacob's Ladder Rabbit. rabbit. It's turbulent and rocky. And uh, it's the scary thing about me why I don't uh, uh, do that. But anyway, so here is uh, Lucas. Even though he wore his helmet appropriately, it slipped back over his head. And he had hit his head and was uh, unconscious. At the scene, CPR was started. The efforts fell in. Lucas Turner, 22-year-old, aspiring young kid, starting his life off, was killed uh, doing the thing he loved. And it was interesting when I read about that, the, the American Whitewater listed it as a long swim, which is not true. And they'll publish all the deaths every year, and I always would read those, but it said he just was swept away. But that isn't what happened. He had hit his head, and that was inaccurate. He died of a head injury is what killed Lucas Turner. Now... This is, an, uh, this is an obligation I have to Lucas's father. Uh, Gil Turner heard that we were doing this after Lee and I started this whole thing, and he called me and he said, I want to speak to your class at the med school. I said, sure. And he cried for an hour. Couldn't even talk. It was the saddest thing. So we tried it again, and it didn't work. But he said, promise me whenever you speak, you'll talk about my son's death. Two fathers in my career have come to me uh, Lucas, his dad, Gil, and then um, Doug Julian, son Doug, who's actively teaching for us now, uh, have come to me because of their son's death in the back country, and I tell their story. But Lucas made me prom or Gil made me promise that I'd show Lucas his dead body, so you could see his head. You do not need to look at this, but I'm going to honor Gil's request. I'll tell you when it's coming on. It's in the ER, and you can close your eyes. But if you are going to look at Lucas's body, you can look at his head wound. And Gil, this is because you asked me to. So I'm going to turn it on now. And there's Lucas's body with the uh, head injury uh, on it. And I'm taking it off. That's all you needed to see. So Gil made me ask me to do that, and I honor that. It was, uh, you know, I've, I've been asked certain things in my life, but that was a sacred request. Anyway, the helmet, this is his helmet. It's a 75 thing buttered REI. And um, it pivoted back over his head, uh, exposing his head uh, when he went into the water. See, if you're on a bike and you fall off with your helmet on, the first thing that your head hits, the helmet hits, is the ground. But in a river, the first thing you, your head hits is the water, which is not harmful, but it can pull the helmet off and then you hit the rock. So helmets had no guidelines or no safety requirements or anything like that at all. So Gil was d distraught and thought about suing the manufacturers. I didn't know what to do. But instead, uh, uh, he did the following. So helmets just aren't safe, generally. So uh, the, the, the bigger story is he asked me, with my bar physics background, would I know, ha help him make a helmet? I didn't know the first thing, but my younger brother David was an engineer, and I, we, he and I went to dinner with Gil, and David didn't know where to go, and then we lost track of uh, Gil. One of those things, uh, last time I saw him was a sad night in a McDonald's up in Park City, and it was, it just broke my heart to see him just sob, and never did uh, really get over that. I don't know how you do, but anyway, um, that was it. And then about four years later, I get a package in the mail out of the blue. And uh, I open it up, it's a kayak helmet. And I thought, what the heck, who's sending me this? Like, what's going on here? And so uh, I looked at it and I, I thought, what is this? And it's got all these straps and things on it. And I thought, what is this? And I flipped it over and up, it has a visor on it. And underneath the visor, embroidered, it said, Lucas Turner. Now I got a chill up my spine. I went, holy cow, 
he did it. Gil created a new helmet. And I called my little brother, and he got one. We each got a free helmet. And no, no, nothing, just a helmet. And uh, so that's what Gil did. He, uh, just like Doug Julian is going out trying to keep you from dying of haste like, like his son did in the, in the mountains at Chain Lakes, 10,200 feet, Gil went out and wanted to save boys' lives like his son. So we went back to Hopkins, the Bloomberg School, and they made it. So I got online, and uh, I found this picture. It's called The Current. You buy it anywhere you buy a helmet. It's the same price, and up in that visor underneath it, it says Lucas Turner. And he's going around, went around, and we include this in all our education so that people will wear safe helmets when they go kayaking. And there's a lot of knockoffs to this now. I mean, the current isn't the only one. Thank heavens that other people recognize it. It has these straps, and this thing comes down in the back. And these guys that did it, oh, I put it in here. So they put a fire hose on it. It doesn't come off. So a couple of summers ago, just before the pandemic, the senior students asked me if I wanted to go kayaking with them on the Weber River, this beautiful canyon we have here. And, and I go in an inflatable kayak, and they all were in a kayaks. Each one of them had that helmet on. They had heard the story, read about it, and, and without me suggesting anything, they had this new safer helmet on. So anyway, uh, the discussion is white water helmets hit the water before they hit an underground rock, and they may pivot backwards. Helmets must be worn in the outdoor activities, but they must also be protective. And just because you buy a helmet, it doesn't mean it's going to protect you, especially if you're going fast and doing crazy things. So the new design should be in outdoor activity. Okay, we're getting late. Um, I'm going to skip this case. See, there's one more. This may be the end. I'm not going to do this one. I'm just not. And I'm not going to do this one. I'm <laughs> oh, good. I could do this one, but I think what we're going to do, let me just see what we got coming up here. Because it's getting late. And I'm, I make sure to get home and have some salmon dinner. Okay, Lee, I will do this one. Lee Schusman managed this case. Do you remember this? This was our very first Cataract Canyon trip. George Snell, if you knew him, his family doctor, head of the Utah Family Physicians. And uh, we got to this rapid right here. It was a it was a hot spring day. Uh, the river was very high. And uh, a, a wife of a family doctor out of Vernal was struggling to get off the boat. Now, this was high water, and this was sponsored by the Utah Academy Family Physicians. And Lee Schusman was involved with that, and this was our first, this was our, our, our very first go at treating, teaching people wilderness medicine. And Lee gave a lot of discussions on that trip. So did George, as I recall. And um, so, this, so uh, this lady gets off. She can't get off. She has to be helped off, and she collapses on the beach. It's, a, it's 100 degrees out. The water is high, and the wind is blowing. It's runoff season. The boat stops uh, to scout a, 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 a rapid. She needs help to leave the raft, and she becomes weak and collapses to the ground. And Lee, feel free to add any to this story if I leave any of the highlights up. She has no underlying medical disease. So you have to understand, this is a trip with a bunch of family physicians and their single mothers or wives, husbands, and now you've got an unconscious woman on the shore with 20 doctors trying to solve the problem. And I just remember that Lee and George ordered everybody just leave us alone. Do you remember that, Lee? I think you sent everybody to the other end of the beach, and they treated it. So here's the question. She has no underlying diseases. So we'll go through the March protocol, which we changed from A, B, C, D, E, because that was antiquated. We, uh, the school of medicine developed March because it's more appropriate for the treatment of people in the situation. She's not bleeding. Her airway is clear. Uh, patient is breathing normally. Heart rate is slightly elevated. The patient is wet from the river. Ambient temperature is 95 plus degrees. Two more days on the river before help can be contacted. We were in the middle of nowhere with an unconscious lady and uh, a couple dozen physicians and Lee and George. <laughs> that was it. And Lee and George took over this. But it was, it, but, so let's look at the possibilities of what this could be. This, uh, uh, this is a really good uh, algorithm to memorize. Uh, uh, AEIU tips, allergies, altitude, epilepsy, environment, infection, overdose of water, meds or alcohol, underdose of medicines, Trauma, toxins, this is A-E-I-O-U tips. It's a good one for lay people and medical people. Otherwise, insulin, meaning diabetes, and psychological thing, and finally stroke. On that list is what was wrong with this lady from uh, the wife of a very good family doctor 
in Vernal. What do you think it is? On a river trip, she has no diseases that we know of. Water is cold, the air is hot, the wind is blowing. I would add that logs were hitting some of the people, small ones, stayed to splash up, but not big ones. Trauma could be a possibility, that's something. But Lee and George knew immediately what it was because they could see the patient. But what do you think on this list could it be? This is a wilderness case, and there's a lot of medical and non-medical people, but this condition is really common. And it was, in fact, uh, the environment. It was hot out, but the water was freezing. And this lady had developed hypothermia on a day when the air temperature was almost 100 degrees. We were all cold. And we got her up onto the beach. And I, and I, I, I say it a little bit. I don't know why it's saying that. That wasn't it. She's, she's oh, here's the clue. She's hypothermic. It's a hot day. She's, cover, she's scared. Psych stuff, hypothermic. She took too many meds. She's having a seizure. She's bleeding somewhere from the trauma in the rapids. No, no, I already told the answer. It's, she's hypothermic from the uh, cold uh, water. Patient was hypothermic. While the air was hot, the water was very cold, the wind was blowing. Her rectal temperature was 93 degrees. Well, who had a rectal thermometer? <laughs> the guy did. The boatman did. He had it in his first aid kit. Because thermometers are designed to go up, not down, right? So you have to have a cold temperature thermometer so it goes down. Because our temperature is about 100 degrees, typically, 99, 98, you know, somewhere around there. And we don't normally get colder. We don't do well with cold. That's why we bundle up. We do much better with heat. That's why we take stuff off when we get hot, but we don't do it with cold. And Paula was pretty cold that day. And I remember Lee giving the, the, this talk once. He really should be up here doing it. I can't go back. But he, Lee remarked, it took a long time to warm Paula up. She just did not get warm fast. And then the next day we were hiking and she slipped and fell and cut her head open. So she was this wonderful case for us. She's never come back. <laughs> we never saw that family again. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, that's it. We'll end here. We could go on forever and I would go on for all night. And no more jokes. But I will, if you have any questions about our program, about how we support medical education for, uh, for uh, wilderness medicine. Any questions about our lectures, or do any of you have a comment you want to make? It's your chance. I think we're done. Okay, thanks. <laughs>